everybody. So the purpose of this joint plenary is actually to close the first stream on uh, evaluating using the no one left behind lens. And so here we're gonna hear from the rapporteurs for the C from the three sessions. So the session one that focused on development, the session two the, that focused on de development and uh, humanitarian nexus, and finally session three where we discussed the case studies and approaches applying the no one left behind lens. We're gonna do it in very participatory way and we will invite rapporteurs just to summarize the key insights from the sessions that, that could be shared with the group. So at the moment, I think we're still waiting for the groups, working groups to come back from the session one. So then I would suggest what we start from the session two. And here I would invite uh, Francesca Bonino to summarize the key discussion points. So this is to report back to, to plenary. If a colleague this morning attended the, the parallel session that focused on gender, in session two, uh, we had uh, a conversation on the emerging findings from a mapping and synthesis of evaluation. And what do they tell us about the humanitarian development nexus? So the starting point, the research question we wanted to answer uh, seemed quite uh, uh, clearly formulated. The challenge, however, was to provide uh, uh, Haig, uh, the Humanitarian Evaluation Interest Group, and more broadly, UNEG, with a mapping on an issue which is very fluid and very much in flux uh, as a conversation that uh, uh, received more impetus after World Humanitarian Summit and the commitment made in Istanbul and reflected in the Agenda, of, in the agenda for Humanity around the new way of working across the humanitarian development, but also uh, peace uh, and, and human rights uh, arms of the UN. So this piece of work uh, really at the moment stays very modest in its ambition to provide a mapping and initial synthesis of evaluative evidence on the topic. And uh, perhaps in this debrief to plenary, you can see maybe a few colleagues coming in, so. Um, in this debrief to the plenary, I thought perhaps to draw the attention on two issues. Perhaps what it is that the study group found that was surprising in a positive way and in a negative way. Are there, are they top, are there topic that we thought we could find more evaluative evidence about where we didn't find and vice versa? So when in the sample of evaluation reviewed, the consultants zoomed in on what evaluation say about the nexus, they thought they were gonna find much more discussion and analysis, for example, touching on resilience both in the evaluation that were commissioned by humanitarian agency and those commissioned by the development uh, uh, counterpart. But actually, when you look at evaluation across the sample of 110 evaluation, resilience did not come out as a unifying concept as we thought it could uh, be. So that's one area where perhaps uh, in the evaluation literature reviewed, uh, resilience did not keep the promise of being a concept that was uh, get a lot of traction in the, in the evaluation uh, reviewed. So that was one. Then let's come to positive surprises. One area that was positively um, uh, looked at uh, in the analysis in the humanitarian cohort of evaluation is that there is an increasing discussion that looks at coordination and coherence. And in this discussion, there is much more attention from the humanitarian agency on looking at the quality of relationship with the state with the government uh, uh, actor and counterparts. That's quite new, perhaps for humanitarian, to 
capture some of the complexity of working beyond uh, the more narrow focus uh, um, uh, humanitarian uh, um, uh, response uh, and uh, aid architecture analysis that we often see in evaluation. So now there is more attention on the space and quality of relations with the government. From the development evaluation cohort, one area that appeared to be quite strong is that there is renewed interest to look at some of the nuances um, that, look to, that speak to risk uh, and risk convergence in country. What are the crisis modifiers in a country and how does risk converge uh, in a country? What do evaluation tell us about that? And uh, interestingly, also evaluation commissioned by some of the IFI institution, Asia Development Bank and World Bank, are increasingly looking at risks and vulnerability. So overall, as uh, in this session, we really try to come out with something as a paper that could be used as a conversation opener more than a final piece that is going to tell us uh, um, the way forward on um, transcending the divide between humanitarian and development. And uh, in the AGM on Thursday, we may bring uh, forward to the group some question on possible next step but the paper will be finalized and shared with the group and hopefully will be used by different fora who are discussing the policy and programmatic implication of this topic. Is this sufficient? Is it okay? Perfect. Thank you. So thank you very much, Francesca, for that summary. Now we will turn to the uh, session three and if Ahmedou from FAO can provide the key highlights. Uh, this session we had three presentation. Uh, one, uh, two from FAO, one uh, on the country program evaluation of Guatemala and how it uh, took into account uh, uh, the, you know, FAO's effort to, uh, to raise the voices and in, uh, include the indigenous people. Uh, the second one was a case study on the Rakhine states, which was a part also of a country program evaluation that FAO conducted in Myanmar. And uh, the third example was an impact evaluation for a project uh, implemented in, uh, in India, in two newly established states in India uh, by uh, IFAD. And uh, it was targeting uh, tribal groups uh, which are uh, vulnerable and uh, characterized by vulnerability and the fact that they are in the rural areas. So, uh, I mean, the facilitator has asked the presenter to address uh, uh, address these uh, four points from the lenses of uh, no one left behind, uh, which was the theme of the session. So, was uh, one of the first question uh, regarding the design of the intervention was the intervention design uh, initially with the lenses of no one left behind. The second was uh, the design of the evaluation. Uh, was it designed also in, with the lenses of no one left behind? And was the evaluation included in the initial design of the intervention? The third, uh, the third dimension was regarding the evaluation management and uh, what should be, uh, what are the skills to look for in the evaluation team when conducting a, a similar evaluation? And the th fourth and last uh, dimension was uh, on the communication and dissemination, what is the best way to, to communicate and disseminate the results of such evaluations and who should we involve in that uh, exercise. Uh, basically, uh, the three, uh, uh, the, the, the FAO uh, case, uh, the Rakhine case studies, uh, yes, it, uh, the, eval the, the project wa were designed to address, uh, to address uh, the issues faced by the, the minorities, the vulnerable groups. So the no one left behind lenses was, uh, was uh, present there, same as in the case of uh, the project, the IFAD project in India, uh, because these tribal uh, pop, uh, groups were characterized by, uh, uh, you know, were vulnerable and uh, were disadvantaged. Uh, for Guatemala, uh, it wasn't necessarily present. Uh, I mean, uh, in, the, in the, the, the case of indigenous people and the special attention uh, 
to be given to indigenous people wasn't especially uh, present in the design. However, the good thing is that some of the project uh, managers uh, ended up revising the project document to address this issue based on their own experience. And this was to some extent corrected for during the implementation of the project. Uh, the evaluability, however, was uh, uh, a bit weaker, uh, for example, in the case of uh, the IFAD project, uh, uh, the, the, I mean the project uh, uh, was trying to do too many things. There were limitations of resources and, uh, and capacity. Uh, there was uh, no explicit theory of change although there was supposed to be also an m and &E system, an m and &E unit which was there, but the capacity weren't uh, sufficient to sustain a proper monitoring and evaluation system to monitor the project's uh, implementation. In the case of the CPEs, the country program evaluations, they were more uh, designed as a sum of projects instead of a program, so uh, the project had their individual theory of change, however, there was no program theory of change, so the teams needed to reconstruct that, and it was a help, uh, helpful exercise that uh, the country office uh, uh, appreciated and uh, gave them the chance to think for themselves for a theory of change uh, to their program. And uh, uh, with regards to the management, yes, uh, it is important to have a sectoral and uh, technical expert in, uh, for example, in the case of IFAD in uh, s conducting and designing surveys, uh, uh, experts in the, in the subject matters. However, it is also critical to have uh, someone who is knowledgeable, uh, who knows the context pretty well and has a history of the project uh, uh, because that's uh, something that the three presenters found to be very important when conducting these evaluation. Uh, the case of Guatemala talked about using an anthropologist, which was very uh, useful and helpful in this evaluation. Uh, what else? Yes. And for, uh, with regards to the communication and dissemination, uh, all presenters uh, pre uh, uh, talked about the fact that they used the stakeholder workshop, which basically uh, which is organized at the end of the evaluation to present the finding of the evaluation and involves stakeholders such as the government representatives, uh, civil society representative, and sometimes also uh, media. However, it should be, sorry. Sure. Okay. Uh, however, it should, uh, it was raised by the, is this, is it on? Okay. It was raised by the Guatemala, uh, in the Guatemala case that the use of the media could be tricky because uh, the, some of the information could be taken out of its context and, uh, and used for political reasons. So need to be careful about that. Uh, I think these were the main points. Thank you. So thank you very much, Ahmed, for the summary. So now we're gonna turn to the session one. And uh, Alexander, would you like to talk yes. a little bit about this? Thank you, Inga. So uh, session one, we have covered um, four um, presentations. We had four presentations from uh, UNDP, UNFPA, UNICEF, and um, uh, Human Rights uh, High Commissioner. Um, and I will ask uh, my colleagues to report back from the, the group discussion. So maybe we start with uh, one, please. Thank you. So we have a small group and we discuss the topic of participation of vulnerable individuals or group who may be affected by the evaluation. So basically um, in the group we are thinking um, one of the things we discuss is first how, how to involve the people um, to, to, to the evaluation process. So one of the suggestion is to try to use the informal association or informal groupings uh, to, to facilitate access to group with the different needs. Um, uh, we can do, um, uh, we can try to identify the NGOs or some informal uh, association uh, to give the, so that they can help us to get access to the, to the vulnerable groups. 
um, we can on another suggestion, uh, another thing the group discussed is to use stakeholder mapping or vulnerability, vulnerability mappings at the community level, um, so trying to, 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 based on that, do the sampling to identify the group to, to, for us to, to try to get access to. Um, another, the group spent time a lot to discuss about the ethical concerns um, because um, it was raised that well, we, we talk about that also this morning in the plenary session. Um, uh, it's sometimes it's even um, for for some vulnerable group, it's even sort of dangerous for them, even for them to be seen talking to the evaluators. So uh, we try to we we talk about different ways to try to ensure a non-threatening environment so that they can feel free to participate. Uh, try, for example, in the case of sex, uh, talking with sex worker to trying to go through involve the law enforcement uh, authorities, trying to f make them feel like protected at least for, to, for the participation. On the uh, involve the legal parents or community leaders in the case of um, uh, uh, children. Um, another way we're talking about online survey. Um, also, we also discuss about um, when we design the evaluation, we try to uh, ask the right question and limit the question we are asking. We don't want to ask every, it, sometimes it's nice to have certain data, but we should try to sort of limit to the absolute necessary question for us to, to, to be able to do the evaluation. Um, maintain, um, try to pilot testing the question, and try be careful with the choice of the words we use for, 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 the, for the question. Uh, we also discuss about ways to try to use secondary data collected by the NGOs or researchers um, rather than um, collecting all primary data on our own. Um, another, I think another thing uh, the group mentioned is uh, try to ensure accountability to the affected population, for example, in the case of humanitarian emerging context, disaster affected community. When we try to explain uh, maybe a suggestion also from the group is try to maybe we can have a short film, something to explain to the, to the um, population about what actually an evaluation is, not to confuse them with a need assessment and things like that to, to start um, to before starting the discussion. So, I mean, I can go on and on, but we are short of time, so I think I'll stop Thank here. You. Thank you. Ms. I, do you want to add any points to uh, one presentation? I think From these are uh, yeah. uh, the key issues uh, that has already been discussed okay. uh, in our group. Uh, uh, I think it's going to be a repetition more of, uh, because yeah. she has already addressed, I right. think, most of the issues that we discussed in our group. Okay, thank you. Shall I invite uh, Maura to share also the insights from the discussion, from the, gr the group discussion, please? Thank you. Uh, in the working group, we discuss of the short the participation of vulnerable groups, but also the participation of beauty bears and how to strengthen the use of human rights based approach in evaluations. So first we start discussing how different groups take different degrees um, on, the, on taking the initiative. They are not only passive beneficiaries, but they become right holders and they, they could become duty bearers. Uh, some vulnerable groups lack power to take their own decisions. So as UN agencies, we are working on capacity building, but also in empower them to claim for their rights. So that way we can be ensured that human rights based approach is assessing evaluations, not only about the rights of the people, but also assessing if they have taken the responsibility of their own rights so they become duty bearers. So in terms of the evaluation criteria and questions, our proposal was that sustainability in terms of uh, should be assessed in terms of the capacity built to claim for their rights and also to empower powerless people. But in terms also of impact, we need to assess during our evaluations what have the recipients done for themselves in and we need to assess if they are using the capacity to claim for their rights. So human rights based approach applied to evaluations needs to take into account both rights and duties. That was the conclusion from the working group. Thank you. Thank you. Krishna, 
and uh, Sergio. Thank you very much. We had a more participatory approach, so I would like to invite my colleague uh, Sergio, who took the role. You want to talk from there, or can we? That's fine. Too. I think. Can you hear me? Okay, in our group we addressed two questions. The first one was what do we need from an approach and methodological point of view to ensure that evaluations are responsive to the no one left behind uh, concept in practice. So um, it was noted that there is a need to make sure that there's a shared understanding on what actually the evaluation is about and what is considered as a qualifying evidence. Um, so the importance of having a country vision on the evaluation. Uh, and for that, it was noted that the importance of certain governing mechanisms for evaluation, such as steering committees and national reference group. Uh, it was also noted that, uh, of, of course, this speaks to the whole idea of country-led evaluations and the need to have strong stakeholders analysis from the outset to identify who is who, who is doing what in the country and have a strong partnership strategy and also strong communication plans from the beginning to the use of the evaluation. From a more methodological point of view, it was noted that we need to be flexible. We cannot be strongly purist in our data collection tools and in their application in the field without taking into consideration the limitation of the context. The second question was how to ensure that um, in-country evaluators are knowledgeable about the country context, uh, the, the cultural codes, and uh, of course the thematic issues, yet they're not uh, pursuing a personal agenda or they're not perceived as such, even if they're not actually doing that. So once again, the issue of uh, the governing mechanism for the evaluation came up as an important point. Uh, also, of course, the idea of having a mix of national and international uh, people on the, on the team. In many countries, uh, you may not necessarily need an international team member for a capacity issue, but precisely for this, for the perceived independence of the, of the evaluation. Uh, also, the importance of UNEG ethical guidance was, uh, was stressed. And it was also noted that some methods might be more at risk than others in terms of the perception or the fact of having a personal agenda. It was referred to qualitative methods have, has been more exposed to this risk, but it was also noted that um, whether qualitative or quantitative, at the end it has to do very much with rigor. So we may have you know, econometrical models that reflect a very subjective understanding of certain issues, and we may all also have qualitative methods that are very rigorously applied. I guess these are the key points. I don't know if Krishna or other colleagues would like to add anything. Would anybody like to add anything? From the group? From, from the group, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Just one overarching idea was, I think among the UN agencies, we take our evaluations and try to do them as well as we can. But all of this now in terms of participation, engagement of the VMDs throughout the evaluation process and how we approach them ethically, how we build the capacity of the national evaluators, institutions to do that right, this needs to be taken at the system level too. And within that, we have a lot of talk now about country-led, country-conducted, country-owned, evaluations, so where are we on that as part of that agenda? When will we, together with you know, the, you know, the, the banks, other institutions, we had Gavi in our team and so on, uh, other agencies that we work with, civil society organizations, we have common approaches to this at the national level. Do we have any examples where this is happening is where I think the next level of work needs to go so that as much as the agencies benefit, the countries also benefit and we all move parallelly. So that was one overarching, I think, idea that came for both of the questions. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last group discussion to uh, Louis and uh, Natalie. Yes, it's, uh, 
Yeah, I'm going to sum up the, the conversation we had, which was a focus on two points. The, the first point was how do we ensure that we have actually um, a, an, an active and uh, uh, participation of uh, vulnerable and marginalized group throughout the evaluation process. And the second point was, you know, the, the, the stage of the dissemination and how we deal with disseminating uh, sensitive uh, issues. So, I mean, overall, the, uh, the conversation was um, um, uh, around the necessity to actually build trust and revisit the power or the uh, relation or the imbalance of power between, you know, the evaluation team on the one hand and other groups, vulnerable and marginalized groups, as well as other stakeholders throughout the evaluation process. Uh, we thought that since this is a unique setting, um, I mean, maybe we should actually consider uh, how this is addressed. Uh, is it addressed sufficiently? Is it well addressed in the guidance that we have, uh, you know, set for ourselves? And uh, as it was mentioned in the conversation uh, this afternoon, some elements are missing, you know, in the guidance. So what we suggested is that we should revisit the guidance in order to ensure while we go through the different stages and the phases of the evaluation that this is really, I mean, this, there is a sort of breakdown of the process in order to ensure that uh, from the structuration stage, structuring, sorry, stage of the evaluation throughout the dissemination stage of the evaluation, we have actually thought that through and actually build the steps that are going to ensure the, the participation, not the formalistic participation, but the substantial or substantive participation of the vulnerable and marginalized groups. So there were a number of examples that were given, uh, such as, for example, uh, making sure that uh, when we budget an evaluation, we set aside, you know, resources in order to, I mean, make the participation of these groups, you know, I mean, possible, I mean, which, you know, has uh, incidences in terms of coordination, you know, having these groups in which we meet with the, uh, the vulnerable and marginalized groups, and that means, you know, setting resources aside, for example, you know, making sure that they will be able to come and participate uh, into these, uh, these, these working groups. Uh, that has also um, uh, an incidence in terms of the methods that we uh, typically, you know, uh, 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 use for our evaluation and looking at them, you know, through this, you know, um, uh, lens of whether these are sort of methods that put those groups into a passive mode. I mean, typically the question answer that we have, you know, in, in <coughs> interviews or in, uh, in, in focus group, and maybe we, maybe we need to actually uh, tailor, I mean, the methods to the groups we are dealing with, which may, me, may be of a totally uh, different uh, nature. Uh, another uh, point is that, um, we also need to think about the accountability uh, of the evaluators and the evaluation team, uh, again, uh, once again, throughout the uh, evaluation process, because while we are very much um, acquainted with this sort of evaluation fatigue on, uh, for example, uh, the government side of things, we also, and actually uh, some of us have said that they have encountered that, there is the risk at the end of the day that we also have a certain evaluation fatigue from those groups because they do not see what these evaluations are leading to. It doesn't change their situation in their daily life uh, on the ground. So we really need to think and to address those concepts as well from, uh, from this, this point of view. Um, uh, when we come, uh, I probably have left on the side many, many things, when it comes uh, to uh, disseminating uh, sensitive uh, issues and while we were talking this morning in our presentation with Natalie about, you know, I mean, the kind of um, uh, difficulties we, uh, we uh, encountered, uh, maybe here again we need to go back to the concept of trust and building, you know, the relationship with uh, you know, all the stakeholders, and that means typically that uh, in the instance of, for example, disseminating to our executive board, uh, it, it would be important once again, and in this case again, to take up the conversation much, you know, uh, you know, 
years ahead of that in order to speak with them about what the evaluation is about, the purpose, the objective of an evaluation, its methodology, so that we there again, you know, build a relationship with, you know, those people who are at the end of the day are, I mean, part of the uh, decision-making process and who indeed can or cannot affect changes for these vulnerable and marginalized groups, uh, which are, you know, at the heart of our evaluation. So, I mean, those are some of the points that we discussed uh, this morning. Uh, Natalie, is there something you would like to add? Or anybody else in the in the group? Okay, so those were the basically in a nutshell the main points. So thank you very much for the, um, your input. So that gave us like a very rich picture of the discussions, presentations, what we had, and I think what we are hearing. So in terms of the key challenges when it comes to evaluating our interventions uh, through the no one left behind lens. It's actually access, it's access to vulnerable groups. It's their participation in evaluation process. So it's also ethical issues. So how to really, um, we, we should conduct evaluations that are ethical, but we don't do any harm to the groups that needs the most help. So in terms of the methodology, we're hearing, again, lots of challenges, but also innovations. It seems that the theory of change is still, you know, proves to be useful in trying to understand actually the root causes, and then being able to reach most of these vulnerable groups and ask the right questions. Participatory methods, again, they are featuring very highly in, in the discussions and also in the presentations, uh, um, what were del delivered this morning, as well as in the working groups. And also very interesting evaluation like impact evaluation as well. So what we have is a range of methodologies ranging from uh, population surveys, impact evaluations, so as well as participatory and qualitative methods. So it's uh, great to hear colleagues' experiences and lessons and challenges what they face. So, and uh, in terms of the next step, so I really appreciate the point that Krishna made in terms of how to really engage and build capacities of national evaluators because uh, uh, reaching those vulnerable groups, so you have to have very good knowledge of the communities. So I will end here, we're already uh, beyond the time. So, but still I think we can continue discussing uh, uh, those issues and the next session that will focus on evaluating transformative change. Again, at the core of this transformative, tr transformative change, we also see this uh, deep, uh, you know, issues of uh, inequality that have to be changed. So I think we will continue the discussion through this EPE. So thank you very much and now it's a lunchtime. <laughs>